You're listening to the Steve Freeman Podcast, the real, raw truth about the pursuit of success in music, business, and life. Here's your host, hit songwriter, multi-platinum selling producer, and serial entrepreneur, Steve Freeman. Joining us today on the Steve Freeman Podcast, probably, well, I don't even have to say probably, my favorite author, because those of you who listen a million strong know that I'm not that big of a reader. But when I do read, I read Brad Thor. And so it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome him into the podcast, New York Times bestselling author, Brad Thor. Yeah. Uh, well, what an introduction. I'm honored. So thank you very much. That's probably one of the nicest things you could say to an author is I don't read that much, but I do read you. You know, I get a lot of people that say, I gave your book to my mom, to my dad, to my son, to my daughter, and you reignited their their love of reading. So I, that that that's one of the nicest things you could say, Steve. Thank you. Well, it, look, it's my pleasure. I spent, you know, 20 years as a professional songwriter and, you know, you go all over the place. People know the songs, but they have no clue who you are. So I, I, I always think it's funny, you know, and I wish I had done something different at times because it's like, you know, when you put a book out, it's got your face on the back of it. It's like everybody knows for better yeah, or worse, true. everybody knows you know, who Brad Thor is, you know, nobody knows who the songwriters are, but, uh, I, I, look, I appreciate it. And you're a busy guy. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast today because I just, like I said, I really, I'm not a reader. And, and I, I remember wanting to get into reading several years ago, but then knowing, okay, I'm, I'm not going to crack the book. I, I, I don't, I don't have time to do that, but what do I have time to do? And my wife and I were in, I think we were in Books A Million or Barnes and Noble somewhere. And she's like, go find one on audio. And I'm like, okay, well, it just so happened. The first thing I reached for and picked up was the Athena Project. And listen to it start to finish and from ever from then on every every road trip every airplane ride everywhere i go i slowly went back i went to google and i googled the all important phrase brad thor books in order and and it pops right up and it took me all the way back to the mm-hmm. beginning and that's where i started and i have now made it all the way through and and david at simon and schuster sent me the uh the new copy of the new book, which I want to talk about today, Black Ice. It is out today, July 20th, everywhere books are sold or listened to. Um, and I, I'm just enamored with with Scott Harvath. And, and I want to get into that. But I want for people that don't know, for, the, for those of the, that have been living in a rock for 20 years, tell us a little bit about your history and, you know, where you came up with this whole idea of Scott Harvath and getting into the pol- uh, political thriller. Uh, space, which, by the way, was not an easy mm-hmm. thing to do, and you came right in and just took over. Well, it's uh, so I've wanted to be a writer, to be an author, ever since I was a little boy. Uh, grew up the son of a United States Marine. My dad's no longer active. My mom was a flight attendant for TWA, and um, the arts, Steve, were something to make us better rounded at home. They weren't necessarily a career path. But when I was on my honeymoon with my wife, uh, we were having a glass of wine one night. She looked at me and she said, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? And I said, writing a book and getting it published. Uh, I mean, I didn't even know the words were going to come out of my mouth. And she said, fine. After the honeymoon, when we're back home, two hours a day, you need to just block off protected time and start making that dream become a reality. And that's what I did. I wrote my first manuscript. There's uh, The Lions of Lucerne, my first novel. Uh, It's funny because when I committed to, okay, I'm going to do that, uh, we then had an overnight train ride in Europe uh, and we shared a sleeping compartment with a lovely brother and sister from Atlanta, Georgia. And the sister turned out to be a sales rep for Simon & Schuster. And I had a TV show at that time on public television, a travel show. 
And uh, the brother and sister were both fans of my TV show. And when we arrived in Amsterdam, she said, well, you're going to do more episodes of the TV show? I said, actually, I'm going to write a book. And she gave me her business card and said, okay, if you do write that book, I want to read it. And if I can help you at Simon & Schuster, that's what I want to do. And this is my uh, 21st novel overall. Uh, I've done 20 with the character Scott Harbath. Uh, I did one spinoff series, The Athena Project. That was the first one you had uh, had uh, encountered. And I tell people that my books, Steve, are like the James Bond movies. You don't need to go back to the beginning if you don't want to, uh, to, to start. You could jump right in with the latest book and you'll be, you'll be fine. I'll tell you something too, that has always amazed me and impressed me with your books because now as an, as an, what I will call myself, I'm not gonna say I'm an avid reader, I will say I'm an avid listener. Um, although I am reading Black Ice, I am actually physically reading because David's like, we're not gonna have the audio in enough time to get, so I'm like, I'll read it, trust me, I'll read it. But with, with each novel, that's what I love so much, but I find it amazingly awesome for two reasons. One is that yes, you can start with Athena Project or you can come Come in at the apostle and in throughout that story you're going to recap that and let the listener know even when you're introducing characters that have been throughout the series they they understand it they know and but however it's great for me because if it's a year it refreshes me and re- okay yes you know it's and it's like i i get reintroduced to those characters every time and i find myself not going okay here we go. Here's here's the refresher for people that aren't up to, is up to date with Brad right. as I am, and it and it flows very very nicely. And and I don't. I mean, I, I've listened to some others, and they don't do that as well, in my opinion. Even though each one is a new novel, a new a new thing episode, if you will, within the series, you you bring the listener right along, so that if you haven't, you don't have to go all the way back. But then, like I said, for me, it's a refresher, and I love it. One of the things that well, I, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say thank you because I actually work hard to do that. I just don't, I don't want to do a cut and paste of the character every single book and put that in. And in Black Ice, I actually have someone that's questioning Scott Harbath, the protagonist, and he's basically got a file. He's like, okay, I can see you were a Navy SEAL. Then you disappeared for a while. I can only imagine what you were doing for the government after you left the SEAL teams. Then then you pop up on the radar again here. It is, it's a refresher, uh, but it also, the big challenge is don't bore your existing readers, especially those that maybe even are binging the books that maybe don't have a year in between episodes. And so they've just put down the, uh, a book from three years ago and now they're on the next one. So that that really is, that that's something that I take very seriously and I, I try to find an interesting way to do it. I read a um, I read a book recently by a Scandinavian uh, writer, and in it, he had his protagonist passing by different buildings uh, in a in a Nordic country where he used to work, and so that was the way to piece his past together and refresh you. So I thought, okay, th- there's there's really cool ways to do this, and I always want to raise the bar on what I do because I tell people I don't work for the publisher, Steve. I work for you. I work for the listeners, for the readers. Those are the people that go on Amazon or Goodreads or Barnes and Noble.com and leave my annual performance review. So I want to make sure that my employers are happy with my work. Oh, that's a great way to look at it. It's I always said the same thing. I never wrote from for my publisher either. I wrote for the listeners and the people that actually bought the music because they're the boss. If if they don't like what you're writing, they'll stop listening yeah. and they'll stop buying and then you're out of a job, which is no fun, you know, no fun at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do no. want to ask you because one of the things, and, and look, I, I know what a lot of other people say, but I always, I, I relate everything to how I feel and, and, and what my experience is. And I have to ask your days with the, the travel show on public television, that has to heavily influence where these different places that you take Scott Harvath, because when I listen to your books and and I'm hearing, you know, what's going on like no other, I feel like I'm there and I feel like I've been there and I've seen it. And you do such an amazing job of not just setting the scene. You literally are putting them in places, naming 
cafes, naming hotels that are real places, and it helps set the scene. Is that something that maybe hearkening back to your days of doing that travel show of going, look, I want to put some of my love for that into these novels by taking this protagonist in, in, in Scott, taking him all these different places. Absolutely. So having been in the travel game, I, I, I love travel. My dad got to see the world with the Marine Corps. My mom got to see it with TWA. And it's just a bug that I have. It's just a part of my genetic code. So I've always loved travel. And I've had some reviewers say that the locations almost become characters in the books uh, because I enjoy describing these areas. And I go to as many of them as I can. And if I can't go, and I'll give you an example of one place I didn't go, didn't want to go. Um, if I can't go, I want to talk to someone who has operated there, whether you're a special operations uh, person or somebody in the intelligence uh, community, somebody whose life depended on noticing things, of paying attention to the little details. So I did something with the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, and there was no way I was going. Their disease was flaring up and all this kind of stuff. I did it for my book, Code of Conduct. And so I found somebody who had operated there, somebody, uh, a Green Beret that had done a lot of very interesting things uh, around the world. And uh, he said, okay, so we were getting to know each other. He said, Thor, what are you looking for? And I said, well, you know, just color items. He's like, well, what do you mean by color items? I said, I don't know. Does everybody have the same bicycle in this part of the world? And he goes, oh my gosh, yeah. He said, everybody there rides this bike called the Mamba. And I said, well, why did they call it the Mamba? Is that just the model name of the bike? He goes, no, because the streets are so dusty, the way the tires are, excuse me, when it goes through the dusty streets, it leaves a trail that looks like a black mamba, the snake. And so I put that into uh, Code of Conduct and I heard from people who have done, uh, you know, medical work or mission work or whatever in, uh, or military or intelligence work in that part of the world. And they said, you must have gone to, to, to the Democratic Republic of Congo because only somebody who's been there knows about those bicycles. So that's kind of cool. And that's that's what I like to do. I think that the, the details are really the bedrock of a good thriller. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And and the, the details, especially in, in like I said, the, the latest complete one was that I finished was near dark. And the the places that you describe and, and it it was one of those I always feel this way, but it's like I I I've never been those places, but I feel like I have. And and it's it, now it makes me want to go see those places, you know, even more. Um, I, I have a I have a question for you. And that is I was uh, I found it interesting recently. Like I said, I don't really read anybody else other than your books. Um, so uh, listening that David sent me uh, all of the Jack Carr books and said, if you like Brad, you're really going to like Jack. And I said and I told him, I said, got to be honest with you. I don't know because I feel like I'm cheating on Brad if I if I listen to it or read the Jack Carr books. And uh, he chuckled. And uh, what I found interesting, though, is getting in, though, I, I loved it whenever there was a moment in the terminal list, I believe it was. And Reese was thinking to himself and he goes, oh, Scott Harvath wouldn't do that. And I thought, you know, right. that's, that has to know you when you when you know now you are totally influencing a completely different generation of people coming along and that are giving nods to your books. And, and it's like that has to be an amazing feeling. And the question I want to ask you is one of the things I found interesting as I was was listening to uh, one of Jack's books is he said he states very clearly up front because of his past. I am not Reese, you know, and I feel so familiar mm -hmm. with Scott Harvath. Do you ever feel like you are Scott Harvath? That you put yourself into this guy's pants and shoes and you're holding his gun, you're putting his hat on, and do you feel like you have become that character? 
I have always said that Scott Harvath is my alter ego, just the way I'm sure James Bond was for Ian Fleming and Jack Ryan was for Tom Clancy. I don't think you can you can live the way you live writing novels and being wedded to this character for years, for decades, and not have it be infused with a lot of you, whether it's personality, sense of humor, specific tastes, things like that. So yeah, Harvath is very much a part of who I am, how I see the country, how I see my obligations as a citizen, uh, my deep belief that there can be no American dream without those willing to protect it, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of me in Harvath Harvath and a lot of Harvath in me. So it, it's definitely a two-way street. One of the things that, I, that I've noticed, and I appreciate, by the way, is that when I read your novels, um, I definitely, as everybody does, everybody has a side of the aisle, if you will, politically, that they fall on. One of the things that I appreciate about the way that you write your novels is that I don't know your political, affi- I mean, I think I know your political affiliation, but it's not strung throughout the books in order to direct one person to believe one thing or not it is about freedom protection united states america it's about our special forces it's it's a peek behind the curtain but in i've never seen in one way or the other you as brad thor the author or scott harvath as the character telling people they need to believe one way or the other and I, 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 I've I recently come across a few that are like, wow, now it doesn't bother me that you're you're making, having your character make that statement, but they are. And unfortunately, our country is becoming even more increasingly politically divided. Is that hard for you mm-hmm. to, to write these stories with the subject matter that they are and not have them take a political slant or stance one way or the other? Well, no, because I think national security is not a partisan issue. National security affects Democrats and it affects Republicans. And I have long said that Al Qaeda didn't pick the Twin Towers because they were full of Democrats. They picked the Twin Towers on 9-11 because they were full of Americans. And heaven forbid ISIS or some other group ever uh, does something terrible in the New York City subway system. They're not gonna post people at the turnstiles and ask to see voter ID cards and say, oh, you're a Republican take the bus today. You don't want to be on the subway. So national security is an American issue, not a Republican or Democrat issue. So I I try to steer away from that as much as I can. But with that said, ever since humans have been interacting as in bands and in tribes, there's been politics. And for as long as there's been warfare between those bands and tribes, there's been politics. It's it's part of the nature of the way things things move. Um, so I tr- Seth Godin gave me a great piece of advice once because I talked to Seth. Uh, I, I was talking to him about wh- how my voice should be on social media and all this kind of stuff. And my company is called Thor Enter entertainment group. And Seth said, Brad, I just want to say to you that whether you're on social media or in your novels, never forget that your middle name is entertainment. That's what people are coming to you for. Uh, I I call what I do faction, where you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins in my books. Um, And I want people to have that great white knuckle thrill ride experience. I do very short, as you know, short cinematic chapters. Um, One of the nicest introductions, uh, in addition to the very kind introduction you gave me and the compliments you paid me, one of the things I love is when I'll do TV or radio and they'll say, the reason I didn't get any sleep last night is because of our next guest, Brad Thor. And they'll say, you know, I was just going to read a couple of chapters because I wanted to get into the book, but I couldn't put it down. So I love that. Um, And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm supposed to sweep you away. I'm supposed to be an escape from the everyday. And if you want people, partisans bickering and all that kind of stuff, you can find it practically anywhere on the Internet. You can find it all over TV. I just want to give you a really good adventure. And if you learn a little bit during that, if you close the book a little bit smarter, saying, wow, I didn't know that that was going on in that part of the world or whatever. It's not a training manual. I got knocked by a 
a CIA guy once. He's like, oh, Harvath would have eight people between him and the guy he needed to get to. And I said, yeah, but you're not going to watch Scott Harvath in a novel have eight different rendezvous until he gets to the guy. I said, if you want to write a textbook for the farm, for the new CIA uh, people coming in, you go do that. You put in all eight steps that would have to go there. Uh, You know, Elmore Leonard once said uh, the best piece of advice he could give to young writers is leave out the parts that people skip. And I think that's great advice. That's wonderful. Well, speaking of of scenarios like that, I'm I'm sure the answer has got to be yes. And you maybe can tell us maybe you can't. But has there been a time or that, that you remember right off the top of your head where you've put a book out and certain people agencies whatever have read it and we're like <clears throat> brad we wish you wouldn't have said that uh because it seems it seems at times a little too real for even factional because it seems 90 percent fact 10 percent fiction Yeah, I, so I got, uh, not too long after 9-11, when the Department of Homeland Security was put together, I got asked to join something called the Analytic Red Cell Program. And basically, the federal government was bringing in creative thinkers from outside DC. They wanted to get outside the typical law enforcement, military, intelligence community mindset and get creative thinkers to help them anticipate what the next attack might be, where it might happen, how it might happen. So they invited people like me, uh, Michael Bay, the director of the Benghazi movie and the Transformers movies, uh, my dear friend, uh, novelist Brad Meltzer. So we came to help them think scenarios that they might not have entertained before. Uh, So that's one thing where I've done stuff for them and I call that program the Las Vegas of government programs because what happens in the red cell stays in the red cell. I can't incorporate any of that into my books. But what I did in those sessions was to use my mind the same way for the government that I do for my novels. And sometimes they'd feed you little pieces of evidence or intel. We figured they they had to be trying to put together stuff and they'd give us these little things and say, well, what would you do with A, B, and C? And we'd spin up scenarios for them. Uh, A few books ago, my book, Use of Force, I started Use of Force out with an attack at the Burning Man Festival in the Black Rock Desert in Nevada. And I learned shortly after the book uh, came out that the federal government ordered a top to bottom security review of the uh, of what goes on at Burning Man, that that really popped, the, the book Use of Force really popped Burning Man under their uh, radar. And they were very afraid that Burning Man could be a target and their security processes and stuff needed to be reviewed. So I haven't ever had the government come to me and say, we wish you didn't do that or whatever. They've come to me and said, help us figure out scenarios, help us think about here, there, and everywhere. And I don't have to have, unlike somebody like Jack Carr, I've never held a top secret clearance. I've never held any kind of clearance. So I don't need to run my books by a review board or any of that kind of stuff. I'm free to write whatever I want to write. So that's, you know, I, I, working Steve with so many experts in these different fields, whether it's SEAL teams, Delta Force, CIA, FBI, I'll have people that are kind of my sources that I'll work with and I will let them see a book before I publish it. And I have had in the past where uh, my sources have said, okay, we told you A and we told you C and B's got to come out of the book. And I'd be like, wait a second, did I get B right? I just made that up. Is that right? And they, they'll, they'll just say, we're not telling you, you just have, to, it's got to come out, change it, pull it out. It can't go in there like that. And being a good citizen, um, of course, I'm going to change that. I, I, a, I don't want any harm to come to my country or my, my fellow countrymen and women. And B, I also don't want to poison the well with my sources. I want to be able, I want them to know, okay, even if Thor does figure something out, if we tell him, please, out of the book, he'll do it. No, and and that's awesome, and, and and it's to like you. That's responsible. That that's being a responsible citizen. And and look, you're you're bound to mm-hmm. all of these different adventures that that you take these characters on. They they you're going to stumble. It. My my father in law once said, who was involved in many of these type services, 
said that if you can dream it, if it's been on television, it exists. So, you know, you have to be very careful. It, you, you can only explore so often before you're going to touch on something that you have no idea that exists. So that that uh, that makes sense. Um, let's move. I want to ask you about Black mm-hmm. Ice. Um, it's out today. Uh, okay. Brand new book. It's probably going to be your, not probably, it will be your next bestseller. Uh, with all the pre-ordering and pre-downloading and all that, it's probably already happened. Um, how do you decide where to take Scott Harvath next? It's a good question. It's where I would want to go. That it, to, so uh, the book opens up in Oslo, uh, Norway. Harveth has got a love interest there who is a uh, deputy director at the Norwegian Intelligence Service. Uh, so tall, blonde, Scandinavian, beautiful, younger than him, super talented, probably even more talented than he is. I really think he's met his match in uh, in Solvi Kolstad. Uh, but so I'm a voracious consumer of news. And uh, that's why I can relate when you talk about how part, how big the partisan divide is and everything. It's because I, I know this because I'm constantly all day long reading articles and all that kind of stuff, not just domestic stuff, but international stuff. So what I'm trying to do, Dan Brown uh, paid me uh, a, a wonderful compliment, Dan Brown, the author of Da Vinci Code. Dan said, Brad Thor's novels are as current as tomorrow's headlines. And so I want my books to be fresh. I want you to pick up my first book, uh, The Lines of Lucerne, that I ever wrote. And I want that to still feel fresh today and that like those things could happen. And I also like beating the news. So Black Ice, for instance, uh, There is, in real life, a brand new Cold War that's happening north of the Arctic Circle. So the Russians have been doing a ton of stuff, building up military bases and doing all these things up there. And regardless of where you are on climate change, there is a scientific fact, which is the temperatures are rising in the Arctic twice as fast as anywhere else on the planet. And as such, the sea ice is turning to slush for longer and longer periods during the year. You know, the summer starts earlier and goes longer. And that's freeing up not only shipping routes up there. So, for instance, the Chinese can go up and over Russia, Shanghai and down to Rotterdam. It shaves 20 days off the trip. So instead of it being like 48 days, it's 28 days for them. So there's there's a big push for China to cozy up with Russia. And they're putting money into different Russian investments, uh, natural gas up there, because China wants to have a presence in the Arctic. They've declared themselves a quote unquote near Arctic state, which is BS because the nearest Chinese settlement to the Arctic Circle is over 800 miles away. It's a ridiculous made up term. Mike Pompeo, when he was Secretary of State, just guffawed when he heard it because he's like, that's just, it's like George Costanza made that up on Seinfeld. It, it means nothing. It's a term that means nothing. But the Chinese, we have one functional icebreaker. The Russians have dozens. The Chinese have a bunch. So the Chinese are trying to put their icebreakers up in the Arctic. So if any ships get in trouble, China can help save them. So that makes China a valuable player up there. There is a race on for minerals, uh, oil and natural gas. And as the ice melts and recedes, everybody wants to get their hands on this stuff. And China also wants to navigate those waters. They could move warships up and over Russia and down off our East Coast. There's a lot of stuff happening that's very, very reminiscent of the uh, of the power plays that happened between us and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So now we're dealing with the Russian but also the Chinese, and it is all happening in the Arctic. Uh, I am seeing articles almost daily about this. I think black ice is timed perfectly to hit this sweet spot. I'm posting to social media all the time, Steve. I'll see an article and I just go straight out of black ice. And so today as the book is published, I mean, it's amazing how going to the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or foxnews.com or cnn.com, you can find tons of articles on why we need to be focused like a laser beam on the Arctic and do everything we can. The Chinese are trying to buy up mining companies that'll give them some foothold up there. They've been trying to buy... use cutouts, Chinese citizens to buy real estate in Norway. It's on like Donkey Kong up there. And it is something that is in our our long-term security interest that we need to have not just one Scott Harvath, but a bunch of them up there doing stuff to thwart the Chinese and the Russians. 
Wow, that's interesting. See, it's it's like I have purposefully tried to remove my finger from the pulse of a lot of what's going on because I when I watch the news, I hear so much that I don't want to hear. Um, and then it makes it difficult for me to stick around for the things I feel like I need to hear. So it, I, I understand 100% what you're talking about because when I read or listen to your books, I feel like I know that, that I've read about you and, and done my homework a long time ago, and I, re, I know that you're so up on current events that I almost feel like I'm getting the new, the worldly news that I need to know when I'm reading a Brad Thor book, because if you're talking about it, it is current, it is relevant, and it's real. And and so I, thank you for that, because I can't watch the news anymore. So um, I, I have to ask this question, and I know you probably get this question in every single single interview but i've got to ask it when for the love of god are we going to see scott harvath on the big screen or the small screen i i mean they, they've got <laughs> one books here i mean come on you know uh, it's like the marvel universe that's how we've described it in hollywood that you buy these books you've got all these spin-off characters they can have their own series and all this stuff. So uh, we are super, super close. I've done a lot of options in Hollywood that just have it. It's made it to your know, scripts have been written. And uh, I joke around that studio executives are like lions. And when you lose one and a new one comes in, he kills all the cubs in the in the pride. So you get rid of all the projects that are on the slate and you start over with new ones. Uh, and uh, in a town like Los Angeles, that's filled with so many beautiful people. I have kissed every single frog in that town. I'm telling you. Uh, but I am very excited because we've got an awesome, awesome top. I, I wish I could reveal to you right now who the director is, who the executive producer is, uh, the other people involved in this. A-list people. And my thing is... I have agreed to let the studio make the announcement and to come out when it works for everybody and they get to do it. But I'm thrilled with what we've put together. And I will say this, that for all the disappointment of getting to the being left at the altar on so many different projects over the years, all of it is worth it if all of those things were stepping stones to get to where we are now. I remember a great piece of advice I received years ago, which is sometimes the best deal is the deal you don't make that doesn't come to fruition. And so all those all those potential deals where people paid us to have the option rights for a year or a year and a half in the past and nothing got made, all that heartache is worth it if the team we have in place now goes into production. It'll just be absolutely awesome off the hook. You know who all these people are, Steve. I know that. Everybody watching this podcast knows who these people are. You've seen their movies. You've They're, they're just phenomenal. So I'm super excited, but unfortunately, I can't say who they are because I'm in an agreement that doesn't allow it. But when it comes out, it's going to be earth shattering. <laughs> I, I I can't I, I I cannot wait. I mean I I think I know. Um, you and me both. But it, it, it's just it's one of those things where you you know you see all these TV shows come out based on on novels and books and and characters and it's like come on I mean we we've, we've got to have Scott Harvath on the big screen I it just it just has to happen There's just too much there. Let me ask you this. Uh, it, Agreed. Uh, some of the characters come all the way through the series of books outside of of harvath who's your favorite character you write i think probably the troll i think the troll is super super interesting nicholas um it's i think that one is the one that I get, I hear from so many people like, oh, are you going to give him his own book? You know, I'd love to see a book just with him. But the new character, Solvi Kolstad, uh, the, the Norwegian spy who's given Harvath a run for his money. I love her. I absolutely love her. And um, she's a real wise cracking, uh, very confident woman, very similar to Harvath in that sense. There's a lot of back and forth where they go at each other good naturedly. So I've really enjoyed writing 
writing her. And what's funny is, is it was, I, it was a challenge. Can I, can I create a female character as good, if not better than Harvath? Um, Cause I've got a lot of female readers. I have a ton of male readers and I got a lot of female readers. So I wanted, and I have a daughter and I, I like creating good, strong female characters. It's, they're never window dressing. They're never just sex objects. The female characters are always integral to the plot. I, I've always done that. I'm surrounded by brilliant women, whether it's my editor, my agent, my wife, my daughter. So what's funny is, is when Solvi Kolstad came out last summer, uh, when I introduced her in my book, Near Dark, uh, I figured I would hear for female readers. And I did. They loved her. But the guys went nuts for her. I had more guys clamoring to give her her own book than I did female readers. So it was it was really cool to have knocked it out of the park with my female readers, but to have the men react so strongly to Solvi Kolstad. So she's back in Black Ice and she's she's awesome as usual uh real badass and very funny so uh so yeah nicholas the troll and uh solvi kolstad i I gotta say i'm split between those two i love those both equally if i had to if i had to say beyond scott harbath well i have to agree it's definitely i was hoping you would say that because that's definitely my my favorite character outside of of harvath and yes with solvi i i was i have to say cracking the book in black ice we, we as i was telling you before we got on my family we've been in nashville for for 15 years we just moved to southern california this well a month ago now um and when i cracked the book i remember looking over and i was like okay i'm gonna get to the prologue and i'm gonna read and i'm sh- I please tell me that this story picks back up on that hotel, either that hotel veranda or on the boat with Scott and Solvi. And, and it's like, and I wasn't just, dis- I, I don't know if I could say that I, I wasn't, you've said she's in the book. So I can say, I was so happy that that's where black ice picked right back up exactly where near dark ended. And it was like, it's almost, mm-hmm. even though they're books 20 and 21, it almost felt like a continuous continuation of the story and and it was re- it, i was so happy to see that she was going to continue to be a part of the series I'm, I'm i'm thrilled to hear that that means i've done my job and so if my other bosses my other employers like you steve agree with that then you know what hopefully i'm going to get a good performance review this year Oh, I have no doubt that you will. Let me ask you one final question. What's next for Scott Harvath slash how far into the next book are you already? So I've got something that I I have an idea I've wanted to use for a while. Um, I was pre-COVID, I was doing research and was on a trip uh, and had no idea that uh, I was very close to a foreign intelligence service had positioned a wet work team uh, very close to where I was. I didn't know that there was a safe house for this team of assassins uh, in in real life. I didn't know that till I got back and I read some more about it. I was like, oh my goodness, these guys were so flipping close to where I was. So I've, I've had this idea um, and I, I was looking for, this thing is an evergreen idea. I love it. I love this idea about this team of assassins being pre-positioned uh, outside of the of the country that uh, pays them. And I was looking for something kind of contemporary to weave in there. And I think I found it. I'm still digging through the news a little bit trying to make sure I can mesh both these things, but I'm into the new book. And so people say, how long does it take you to write a book? Well, I publish a book a year and I joke with people. I'm like, how long is a piece of string? Every every book is different. Some books demand more research time. Some books demand more writing time. Uh, There was once, and I'm so sorry, I can't remember who said this, but someone said that easy reading is damn hard writing. And it's very true. So uh, I'm, I'm, I've am I'm started next summer's book, uh, but I'm still kind of marinating in the research because I'm, I'm, there's so many different ways. The book is the highway, but there's many different on-ramps and I'm kind of testing different on-ramps and writing and saying, is this the way I want to get on? Because a hallmark of one of my books is that the action starts on page one and I don't let you go and 
until the very end. So I get you you know, vice grip and I hold on to you until the close of the book. So how I initially grab you, whether I grab your arm or grab you around the throat is my preference. How I do that, how I come in for the throat is, is really key. And I can't make progress until I'm 100% convinced I've got the right motion to grab with that first sentence, that first paragraph on that very first page. So it's getting there, uh, but I'm not super deep as of yet. I'm doing the touring now because Black Ice is out. And as soon as the, the media tour and all that kind of stuff is done, I'll be able to crawl back into my bunker and, and focus again on next summer's uh, thriller. Well, we'll look forward to it, but we can also stay on topic today. The brand new book from New York Times bestselling author Brad Thor is available the next in the Scott Harvath series, Black Ice. Go get it now. It's available anywhere books are sold, books are, are listened to. Just make sure you go get it. Brad, again, as a huge fan, thank you so much for taking some time. And if you're ever out, I would, what's oddly enough is I didn't realize that you were in Nashville. And, and it's like, wow, I should have done this a long time ago. We could have done it in person at the studio. It would have been would have been a whole thing. But uh, nevertheless, if you ever make it this way out here, I'd love to, to buy you a dinner or, or whatever. And thank you for, for making the time today to come on the show. And uh, I, I cannot wait to uh, take the next few days and, and, and finish up this book because uh, as far as I've gotten so far, it may be the best one yet. You're so hard to top. And I don't see how you keep topping yourself, but each one is just gets better and better and better. But everybody right now, go pick up a copy or download Brad Thor's latest book, Black Eyes. Brad, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Steve.